Uh, tell you what, when we were starting our last church, uh, we had a lot of people that were not Christians that were interested in the church, and they had kind of a bugaboo about organized religion. Have you ever heard that from anyone? Like, I don't believe in organized religion. And of course, I would always say, that's great, because we're very disorganized, you know, it was a... Uh, and now I didn't really have a word for it, but our scripture from Acts chapter 2 gives us a really great picture of what the difference between organized and disorganized, or maybe a better word to say would be organized and more organic. Did you notice the distinction of where these first Christians were meeting? They didn't have churches to go to. They didn't have buildings. So they met in the temple courts, and they met where? Did you catch that? And what did they do? Eat. Hallelujah, right? That's right. So a lot of tension in churches sometimes comes bet between that temple and home distinction because they're different, aren't they? There's different dynamics. If you come over to my house, I'm usually not wearing a microphone. It's just not normal. That would be a little strange. I don't have a little platform built up in the living room where I speak to everybody. Hey, Jesus loves you. Did you know that? Now, why not? Is that bad to do that? No, of course. There's a different dynamic when it comes to being in someone's house, right? You're sitting on couches or around a dining room table and you're just enjoying each other in a different kind of a way. Does that mean home is better than temple? No. Does that mean temple is better than home? No, but they're critically important to the dynamics of the church. And for the first 400 years of the church's existence, the early church, they had no buildings. They simply had homes or open areas where they could gather. And so they were much more on that organic side, if you will, than super organized, structured, with all the kind of trappings of church. Now, of course, when the Roman Empire converts to Christianity, all of these pagan temples get turned into service as Christian churches. And you can imagine a lot of priests of these pagan temples thinking, you know what, I don't want to be out of a job, so tell me more about Jesus. <laughs> Might have been a little bit of a cynical turnover, I'm not sure, across the Roman Empire. And so these Christians took over the whole place in just 400 years, and as Christianity gets poured through all of the strata of Greco-Roman society, it changes, and perhaps and not for the best. Because at that time, Christianity became very much a temple-style religion where the faith was about coming to events at places where you would consume content, information, where you would offer your offering. But there was a lot less home going on. Now, I think over the years, there's kind of been pendulum swings between these two dynamics. And if you even think about your life here at St. John's, maybe there was a time when you felt, oh, more temple connected, meaning the big church, the Sunday morning event, if you will. And there were times when you felt more connected in that home, intimate connection with other people, sitting around eating some Doritos or whatever it is you do at your house. Maybe Doritos isn't the best example, but... It says in the Bible that they broke bread. I guess that's not quite the same as Doritos. But what's the implication? Is there a communion vibe in that? Probably. They're certainly having the bread and the cup. They're sharing in that gift of Jesus' body and blood. But even beyond that, or among that, with that, around that, is the sense of eating together, spending life on life uh, time. And when we miss that, of course, when church uh, becomes only an event on Sunday morning. We don't have the full experience of the faith. It's just not adequate. If we're too organized and not organic enough, or too organic and not organized enough, we start to have these rifts and shreds, and, and parts of the church just don't, just don't make sense anymore. But when we get temple and home structured and unstructured, organized and organic, when we get that tension and we live and breathe with it, then all of a sudden... Christianity makes all kinds of sense because there are so many commands that Jesus gives and Paul gives across the New Testament that you cannot do very well on a Sunday morning. There's just not enough time. Bear one another's burdens. Well, do you do some of that on Sunday morning? I hope so. We pray for each other. We share uh, for a few moments about how life is going with our ups and downs or whatever it might be. But where's the best place to bear one another's burdens? 
in the home, off the campus. Now, I suppose you could have a meeting at church that was a smaller group, and in fact, many churches have really comfortable rooms, you know, fireside rooms and couches and and, uh, all of that. Why? Because they're trying to create a home-like experience on their campus, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's so much more authentic feeling. I think you'd agree when all of a sudden things are happening at home. Now, of course, when we started our church down south, we didn't have a building. We rented a space from the Seventh-day Adventists because they worship on Saturday. So perfect for a Christian church that's worshiping on a Sunday. That worked out perfectly uh, for us that they had that bugaboo about Sunday worship. And so we had their space. But we only had it for four hours on a Sunday morning. And it wasn't until just as we were leaving that we got into a permanent a facility that we had 24-7, seven, seven days a week and what have you. But the, for the first, what is that, six or seven years of that congregation, we had a Sunday experience for just a very short time, a couple hours, but the rest of the week, every other event, every other meeting, every other connection was where? Well, it felt like it was at my house. That's where it felt like. Cindy and I felt like, as introverts, we were uh, painfully aware of how many people were coming through our homes, and we got to really embrace that, but it took a little bit of a challenge for us. It was a bit of a, a bit of a stretch. I remember when I was in seminary, and I was told, you have to keep professional distance from your people, <laughs> like I was a psychologist or something, and I couldn't get too enmeshed. And I, I remember uh, uh, people telling my wife, oh, you can't have friends in the church. <laughs> Can you imagine that kind of nonsense? And that was what passed for seminary education back in the... Now, is there some way in which a pastor has to maintain a certain whatever? I mean, I get all that. It's a temple. It's a home. It's a tension uh, that we live with. But boy, if we had done that, we certainly would not have grown a church. Now, my son, the lone extrovert in the family, he would always ask every single day, who's coming over tonight? (laughs) He was hungry for it. He loved it. He ate it for breakfast, right? Because he loved meeting new people, hanging out with new folks. And of course, all the kids and the trampoline and the hot tub and every, every chance he got to goof around and be with people, he was all in. Now, how do you feel about that? How do you like having people over in your home? What's your entertainment hospitality setting? Do you feel like, yeah, I could break bread with some folks. I could spend some time chilling on my couch talking about Jesus. Is that something that you feel comfortable with? Or is it better to keep that separate and keep it at church, for goodness sake, so you don't talk about taxes or religion or politics or whatever? You know, you keep that stuff part of you. I don't think that's healthy, is it? In fact, what I found is important as the event of Sunday morning is. I mean, I dedicate my life to making sure that uh, churches have Sunday morning experiences where people can meet Jesus. I mean, that's a that's a huge part of my job. So I certainly wouldn't want to abdicate that or set that as, as as an unimportant priority. But what I found is I can't make disciples when I preach. I would love to be able to do that because it would be much more efficient. <laughs> If I could just look out across the room and all of a sudden people were being discipled. Now, are there discipleship-like things that happen in the temple kind of setting? Of course, that's right, there are. There's teaching of the Bible, there's praying, there's all kinds of experiences that we have that move us closer to God. And I guess you could call that a part of our discipleship journey. But if that's it for you, Sunday morning is it, then you're going to miss the opportunity to do have the experience that Jesus had with his disciples. Now, Jesus did preach to crowds, but he wasn't under the illusion that he was discipling hundreds or thousands of people with his great teaching. How did Jesus do it? He got 12 guys together, and they spent some significant time. Now, of course, they went to temple-like events. They did temple-like stuff. They went to all kinds of rituals that were part of their faith tradition. But I've noticed that life happens more often off campus than it does on. Unless you're just here all the time, the way some of you are. (laughs) Where does life happen for you? I'm going to guess a lot of it happens within your house, within your home, within your friend's home. That's where life goes on. That's where we experience joy, where we laugh, where we kick back, where we unwind, where we're, defenses are down, where so much of us is just fully open and vulnerable to receive and give love 
between each other. In fact, it got so much in the early church, they sound like a bunch of communists or hippies, don't they? They're sharing everything in common. Did you hear how uh, Tim was reading that? So we're just going to need all your credit cards, all your car keys, all your house keys. Just drop those in the offering as it goes by a little bit later because we're going to start, well, no, that wouldn't work, right? It's not communism. Communism says everything that's yours is mine. What is Christianity saying? Everything that's mine is yours. It's a voluntary association, right? It's a hippie commune. I don't know what you want to call it. It's a bunch of people who without buildings decided we want to spend some time worshiping together, learning together, praying together, eating together, all of that sense of fellowship built in. And what are we going to do? We're going to start living in the same houses. We're going to start doing the same stuff. Maybe even some of their jobs lined up. Paul was a tent maker and he brought people into his tent making business. Why? So he could disciple them and of course, so they could eat. It's nice to have a job if you need some money, isn't it? But that kind of experience, that 24-7 kind of experience is not the norm for most Christians in North America. It's just not part of their existence. Now, if you've been around St. John's a while, I'm going to take a leap and say you have done some serious home stuff, whether it's been on the campus or not. You've got connections that run really deep. And when I said, how do you bear one another's burdens? You've been doing that, some of you, for decades so well with such grace and such love. In fact, as I learn more about St. John's, I see all these groups that have been together, some of them for a really long, long time. Bible study groups, either at homes or here, these kind of small group experiences where you do home-style stuff. But we've got a lot of new folks coming to St. John's these days. How are we going to give them that kind of experience? So often what we found is the longer a group goes together, the harder it is for a new person to feel comfortable in that group. Not because we don't want to welcome people, but because when you come and you, uh, you know, around people that have been together for so long, there's all these kind of inside jokes and experiences, and even though people can be super welcoming, it can be hard to feel like you're breaking in to that experience. Someone once equated it to uh, sitting next to a couple on a couch that was making out. <laughs> it's like, there's really something beautiful going on there, but you're just not sure you should be a part of it. You know, it's just a little bit, little bit too intense. Why? Because we've shared all of our stories and brokenness and healing and struggle and all of that has been. And so what is the best way to get new people engaged and involved and feel that sense of home that St. John's, I think, is famous for? Well, we need to start some new groups. We need to have more home experiences for people. And this fall and into January, we'll be talking more about that because we want to see more folks engaged. In fact, I could out the Riveras because they've been doing a, a new group around our church once a month. On the first Sunday of the month, they invite all of their neighborhood to come over to their house. And it's crazy because Chrissy knows every single person in their neighborhood. <laughs> Here's the thing, none of those people come to St. John's, but they love Chrissy and Mark and they want to be at their place and they invited Cindy and I to come be a part of that. And so we've gotten to know all of these wonderful people who have not been to church, some of them in decades or longer or never. I mean, these are just, uh, you know, average, regular, everyday people and they're fantastic and they're wonderful. But what if we had 10 groups like that around St. John's where people in your neighborhood we're just welcome to it. Now, the key of something like this is you got to keep it lightweight and low maintenance. You can't have uh, put on a full, you know, catered, fancy, schmancy Thanksgiving feast, as some of you might be tempted to do. What do we do at Mark and Chrissy's place, and what do we do in our last church all the time? We had people bring stuff, so everybody brings what they like to eat. And sometimes people didn't quite get the memo that they should bring something substantial. You know, so I remember one night we had a, a, a potluck at our house. And uh, Cindy made some really big casserole thing, and it was fantastic. And then everyone else brought like, a, I don't know, like like a, 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 a box of cookies from uh, Albertsons and like a, a thing of McDonald's fries. And somebody brought a bag of M&Ms. And we're like, okay, this will work. <laughs> I mean, it was a little slim pickings at time. And then other groups are more like St. John's where you say, bring a potluck and you have like food for 50 times as many people who were present in, that are actually there. And so it just kind of went on and on like that. Now, when you have these kind of groups, when you have this kind of time together, when you're eating together and hanging out together and spending time, as so many of you know, you talk about real stuff. You get beyond just the handshake and the coffee 
on Sunday morning, and so much happens in those times. I think it was one of the keys to the power of the early, early church as the Spirit was flowing through people, healing people, signs and wonders. So much of that happened right in people's living rooms. And it has a huge influence on the temple when we have that kind of close connection. So many of the new members told me, as we've said time and time again, it was the loving people in this church that made me want to spend some time here, that made me want to connect more deeply. The home has a huge influence on our worship life, on our group community life. I remember we had a, a, a foreign exchange student living with us at our uh, down south, and, and she lived with us for a year. She was from China. Not a Christian, didn't know anything about Jesus, you know, just a wealthy Chinese girl, just a fantastic young lady, and she lived with us for a year. And uh, the first Sunday she was in church, Cindy and I were running around doing all the things that we do, and we weren't really paying close attention, but she just kind of rolled with it, and, you know, she came with us, and she was sitting there, and communion came, and we realized she went up and got communion just because she followed everything. We are like, oh my gosh, <laughs> this person doesn't know anything about Jesus, and she went up and got communion. I mean, it wasn't so worried about the, the, the I just didn't want her to have an experience without knowing what all of it was about. I didn't want her to kind of have that confusion about it. <laughs> And so we were kind of freaking out just slightly about it as we, as we were uh, processing it after worship. And, and Micah said uh, to Cindy, he said, oh, don't worry, uh, 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 Mom, I, I told her everything she needed to know. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like six at the time or something. And he, he said, I told her, you know, Jesus died for your sins, and, and this is a meal where we remember that, and he's with us. <laughs> oh, man, what is going on? You know, what's happening? The home is influencing the temple, our religious experience together in communion is more meaningful when a six-year-old can share the true depths. Of, now, did he get all the communion theology right? Maybe not, but the enough was there that you would say, yes, he gets it. And so Mike is going to be teaching all of our first communion classes from now on around, <laughs> around, uh, around sin. Now, I wonder what God might be saying to you this morning in terms of your experience of the faith. When the church starts after Peter's sermon and 3,000 come to faith, they've got a lot of logistics to work out. They've got a lot of groups to start. They've got a lot of people to disciple. And so I imagine they spent a lot of time together. And of course, the scripture concludes this passage, the second chapter of Acts, by saying, day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. They weren't satisfied with 3,000. They weren't satisfied with huge temple experiences. They said, more, Lord, is what we're looking for. And so much of that more, I believe, is going to be happening as we invite more people, not just to Sunday, but to Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, off campus, around campus, in these kind of small fellowships. And so, Lord, is there something you're particularly saying to us as individuals today? a way to stretch, a chance to grow. Give us that word right now. Give us good courage, Lord, not to just stay with what's comfortable. We thank you for the friendships that we have, but would you make room for other friends in those circles? Give us eyes that see needy people that we could minister to and care for at a deeper level than we can just here on Sunday. Keep meeting with us and strengthening us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.